One does not simply walk into Mordor. Its black gates are guarded by more than just orcs. There is evil there that does not sleep. And the great eye is ever watchful. There is an evil there that does not sleep. And the great eye is ever watchful. And we so often forget the little details when taken aback by grave news. But it is in those little details that an even graver danger is spoken of. An evil which does not side with foul men or orcs, but hunts and consumes them all. A monster only ever temporarily placated with sacrifices of living, sentient flesh. Her ladyship, Shelob. Welcome, Meldonyar. I am happy to see such a great many new faces here. I hope to see you all return next time, when we will look at why it was that the dwarves, bearers of seven tainted rings of power, never became Nazgul. So be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be reminded when the next chapter starts. But this week we ask ourselves, who and what was or is Shelob? It was around 7,000 years before the destruction of the One Ring that the monster known as Shelob was born in Nandunkortheb, the Valley of Dreadful Death. Her mother, if one could call it such, had been the demonic Ungoliant. Yes, the same Ungoliant we spoke of recently, who drained the light of Valinor, ended the years of the trees, and almost destroyed Melkor Morgoth himself. So if you have any more questions about that, or are just curious, I would urge you to return to that chapter. As she had ended the years of the trees and the Valar began the first age of the sun, Ungoliant made her way to Middle-earth and, for a time, came to live in Nandungortheb. She cleansed that place of light and life, but not before using some of the creatures there in other ways than just nourishment. In that valley of dreadful death, she beget offspring that had her physical appearance of monstrous spiders and that fed themselves on the fear and terror and life of their victims. Not even the high elves who faced the hordes of Morgoth dared enter here, and the one single hero that managed to cross this place alive before it was wiped off the face of Arda dared not speak of it, lest the horrors of those memories overtook him. But as Nandungurtheb vanished beneath the waves during the destruction of Beleriand, when the host of the Valar came out of Valinor to fight the powers of evil and ended up destroying the entire continent, there was one daughter of Ungoliant who managed to escape that cataclysmic destruction and make her way to the remainder of Middle-earth and bring the nightmare of her kind to the rest of the world. Most like a spider she was, but huger than the great hunting beasts and more terrible than they because of the evil purpose in her remorseless eyes, those same eyes that he had thought daunted and defeated. There they were, lit with a fell light again, clustering in her outthrust head. Great horns she had, and behind her short, stalk-like neck was her huge, swollen body. A vast, bloated bag, swaying and sagging between her legs. Its great bulk was black, blotched with livid marks. But the belly underneath was pale and luminous, and gave forth a stench. Her legs were bent, with great knobbed joints high above her back, and hairs that stuck out like steel spines. And at each leg's end there was a claw. 
she also possessed a horrible venom, which would paralyze any pitiful being that fated to fall into her clutches, and which she admitted either through the spittle drabbling from her beak, or from a separate sting, which she would stab her prey like a trait inherited from a demonic wasp. And once stung, though paralyzed, her prey would remain conscious, witnessing how this monstrous spider would loom over them before biting down on them and slowly starting to suck the warm blood from their veins. She looked truly was an outgrown spawn of hell, and not just in the end. From the very beginning of her disgusting life, she haunted the world. Together with her spawnlings, she made unsafe the entire stretch of land between the two elven kingdoms of Dorthonion and Doriath. None but the most daring or desperate dared to traverse that region, and many elves and men met their horrible end in Nandungorthab, while Shelob and her kin feasted on their bodies, growing greater and fatter. After centuries of terror, when the world was reshaped and the second age of the sun came into being, it also marked the end of most giant spiders. For the western lands of Beleriand sank beneath the sea, and of Ungoliant's original spawn, only Shelob was able to save herself from the chaos. By what route she came east and south is unknown. But, at last, she made her way up into the dark slopes of the Eiffel Duat, the western mountains of Mordor, where she made her home in the dark caves, long before Sauron had ever chosen that land for his dominion. Here she began to spin her webs, though these too were no ordinary spider threads, because like Ungoliant, her sire, Shelob was a light eater. Her webs were her domain, and within them she consumed all, down to the last shreds of light, creating a place of unsurpassed cruelty and horror. This was Torech Ungol, the tunnel of the spider. It was a place you and I can scarcely imagine, caves without any hint of light. A blinding, impenetrable night. But where light left, she filled the tunnels with her foul aura. A black vapor wrought of veritable darkness itself that, as it was breathed, brought blindness not only to the eyes, but to the mind, so that even the memory of colors and of forms and of any light faded out of thought. Night had always been, and always would be, and night was all. Thus empowered by a world of her own making, truly her dominion, her ladyship Shelob hunted, grew, and grew fat. She drank the blood of elves, humans, and orcs, and any and all poor creature that dared to get close to her domain would be consumed by her, and nothing escaped her clutches. Shelob served only herself, as she knew no master. In her dream she desired only death and destruction of all living beings, and for herself a life of devouring until she grew taller than the mountains in which she lived. From her lair, her brood spread to the surrounding canyons, infesting the mountains to the east, and eventually spreading their filth even to Mirkwood to the north. Later, when Sauron came to Mordor and built his mighty tower of Baradur, he simply chose not to bother her. For him, she was the perfect guardian over the mountain passes, as no one could even hope to slip past her unnoticed. 
Although she never took him as her master, nor obeyed any of his commands directly, he called her his cats, and would occasionally even bring her orcs or prisoners to feast upon. As such, Shelob lived through the later millennia, but the times of abundance were soon over, as her food became scarcer and scarcer. Elves and humans no longer came near her mountains, for they had given way to Sauron's terror, leaving only the dark hordes of orcs for her to hunt and eat, though she quickly got tired of them. However, Almost 40 years before Frodo's arrival in Rivendell, it happened that Gollum stumbled upon Shelob's tunnels when he was looking for another way into Mordor. There, in that absolute darkness, he had bowed and worshipped her, and he had brought her food. Though it was not completely out of free will, for the darkness of her evil will walked through all the ways of his weariness beside him, cutting him off from light and from regret. Gollum had to obey. Although he hated her, he saw in her a unique opportunity to regain his precious, the One Ring. Shelob knew or cared little for towers or rings or anything devised by mind or hand, and thus, after consuming the bodies of her victims, she left all possessions of theirs where they fell. And as such, when Gollum became Frodo and Sam's guide to Mordor nearly forty years later, he lured the two hobbits into Shelob's caves, nearly bringing them to their doom. And it would have been so, had it not been for Samwise Gamgee. He took his fallen master's sword, severing one of Shelob's legs and, with a second stroke, piercing one of her eye clusters. Enraged, Shelob attempted to crush him with her body weight, but instead she rammed herself into Sting's upstanding blade, cutting deep into her stomach and guts. In a last attempt, she tried to hold Sam down and stab him with her poisonous sting, wanting him to share in his master's doom. But the brave Samwise defended himself. With Galadriel's file in his hand and the mighty enchantments in ancient Sindarin upon his lips, the star glass ignited in blazing light. The fiery rays entered Shelob's head through her mangled eyes searing it with indescribable pain, while the feeling of flame spread from eye to eye, blinding her completely. This was enough for her. Filled with her own fear and terror, she scrambled back to her caves, where she would lament her own suffering until, at long last, she would die of her injuries. We hope for none have ever found her withering body, and thus it is possible that, in long years of darkness, she healed herself from within, that her eye clusters grew back, and that one day, in the dawning fourth age of the sun, she would once more begin to stir and afflict the world with her wretched hunger. Thus we conclude this chapter and this video. Did the knowledge surprise you? Let us know in the comments. If you enjoyed it and would like to learn more of the inner workings of Arda, be sure to subscribe and click the bell icon to be notified of the next chapter in the Mysteries of Westerners and learn why exactly it was that the dwarves, the bearers of seven tainted rings of power, and seemingly, in many things, the equals of the nine ring-bearing lords of men, never follow them in their fate and became Nazgul. But for now, I have been Irjikor Kuruvane, and I wish you all Namarie Meldonjar.